Okay, so we are now in the final section of going through the scripture, we are in the New Testament. And in bringing you the New Testament, we have chosen to identify 53, as it works out, 53 of the most important chapters in the New Testament. Now, the reason for that is the Synoptic Gospels, Matthew, Mark and Luke, uh, they're called Synoptic because they're pretty much parallel. The one that stands out is John's Gospel. Um, they're not written for historical record purposes. The whole purpose of the writing of the four Gospels is actually to convey the theology of who God is and in my poor grammar why God is who God is and why God is and if we look at the scope of the New Testament there are key chapters which identify the main strands of theology that is not to say that the other chapters are not important. I think every word of scripture has something to teach us. And nothing should ever be neglected. Jesus says, not a dot, not a T will not be fulfilled. So every dot and every T is centrally important. Having said that, for our consumption purposes, we have identify these 53 chapters that basically cover the essential theological principles of all of Scripture. It's not just the New Testament, okay? Because the New Testament is the fulfillment of the Old. And they're actually one testament of God's love and His desire to have a covenant relationship with all of us. So let's keep sort of that context in mind. Now, in one of the chapters we've identified, it's John chapter 11, and it's the story of Lazarus. I think nearly everyone would, have, would be familiar with the name Lazarus, right? Who was Lazarus? The guy who died. rose from the dead. Kind of a famous character. I kind of look forward to meeting Lazarus. Uh, little bit of context Lazarus was the brother of Mary and Martha their home in Bethany was a village about two miles outside of Jerusalem now two miles is roughly the distance from here to Bagna Towers right so just two miles outside of Jerusalem uh, and Jesus obviously felt welcome and very much at home in Bethany. For in John chapter 10, verse 40 and 42, uh, we are told that Jesus was currently, current in this story, staying in the area of Perea, which is about 20 miles from Bethany. 20 miles, I worked out, is roughly here to Mabunkong. Everybody know MBK? I know all the Singaporeans do. Like, if you need to meet a Singaporean in Bangkok, go to MBK. <laughs> Throw a stone, every second stone you hit a Singaporean. <laughs> so, back in those days, there was no BTS. So it was a day's walk. If, if I got you going now, you, you'd get there maybe by, I don't know, by sundown or something like that. But keep in mind, they didn't have pavements and overhead bridges. They had to traverse uh, some pretty rugged terrain with hills and so forth. Bangkok's perfectly flat. Uh, I, I didn't realize that until my younger girl, Yana, who, who we brought over when she was four, um, said, when we went back, were back in Singapore, she says, oh, yeah, it just occurred to me that some cities do have hills. <laughs> because if you think about it, all of Bangkok is flat. You, you are, the only inclines are to the U-turn bridges 
and, and the overpasses. That's the only time your, your car goes uphill or downhill. Uh, otherwise, it, it's flat, right? So anyway, that's uh, Bethany, about a day's journey, and it was across the Jordan. Now, we in the opening couple of verses of chapter 11, and we kind of got it up there, but we're looking at chapter 11. You can either turn to it in your old-fashioned Bible or your phony ones. Oh, that's so bad. I don't think I'll use it again. Okay, so we learn that Lazarus is ill and Mary, his sister, and this is the same Mary who poured ointment on Jesus' feet and cleaned it with her hair. All right? So she obviously had a very personal relationship with Jesus. And this is just for us to note that it wasn't just some person making a request. It was someone who was specially close to Jesus. So he gets this message that their brother, the brother of Mary and Martha, uh, was ill and very close to death. And that he should come immediately. This was a very urgent request. The first part of this message I call the refusal. The refusal. Okay? I got three R's for you today. But the first one is the refusal. So we read in verses 4 to 6 that Jesus tells his disciples, This is urgent, but we're not going. Which is rather strange because they, they weren't busy. There wasn't a situation where he had a crowd of 5,000 waiting to be fed. Or a whole bunch of people wanting to be healed. He wasn't in the middle of anything. Um, yet he says, we're not going. Um, and we are told that, you know, the message was sent to Jesus with a little reminder. You know how people underscore things with kind of subtle emotional arm twisting? Lazarus... Uh, the one who Jesus loved. So he's being reminded, hey, this, this is a person you said that you love a lot, so please come uh, immediately. Now he doesn't just hang about and delay for a couple of hours, he's actually delaying two days. Alright? Um, now, why the delay. The disciples were inclined to ask, did Jesus perhaps not love Lazarus that much? Maybe there was something going on in that relationship we didn't know about and it just said that he loved him. Uh, was he indifferent to the suffering of Mary and Martha? And so I'm sure in the background chapter amongst the disciples, it was like, well, maybe Jesus doesn't really care that much. We're not sure. Sometimes he does really strange things that we, we don't understand. So he says that he loves. And then here we've got this critical situation and he doesn't seem to want to respond. Perhaps there was some speculation on whether he was afraid to go back to Bethany. Now, Bethany was in Judea. And there was a price on Jesus' head. Okay? You know, like in the cowboy movies, he got wanted. Yeah. So there's kind of, if it was back in the Old West, there would have been those little posters, you know, with a bounty on Jesus' head. So there was literally a price on Jesus' head. But I think you're familiar with the story, and the reason for the delay is actually given to us. In verse 4, the reason is, it's for God's glory, so that God's Son may be glorified through this. And if you move on to verse 15, uh, we read that the reason for the delay is also that you might believe. And again it's repeated in verse 42, for the benefit of the people that they may believe. So these are the reasons given for Jesus' refusal or delay 
in going to meet Lazarus' needs. Now, Mary and Martha wanted an immediate response, as we often do. Like the young man who prayed, Lord, give me patience now! Okay, if you didn't get it, check with the person next to you. <laughs> On first appraisal, Jesus' delay would seem to be cruel, indifferent, and even uncaring. But that is because we do not have the full picture. And I just pause there very quickly to say, the longer I live, the more I realize I never have the full picture. And I see all of you of similar vintage, <laughs> nodding in agreement. Because the longer you live, you realize so many times you thought you had it down pat. You thought you knew what you were talking about. You thought you had a right to speak into that situation. And right after you realize you didn't have the full picture. So actually my default position now is, I don't have the full picture. <laughs> and it's better to be a little cautious. You, we have to make decisions. I don't, don't let that be a reason for procrastination and just not acting. Right? Very often, given positions of responsibility, we do have to act with what we know. But I think it's helpful to have in, in the side mirror, as it were, the fact that in all likelihood, we don't have the full picture. And that gives us an openness to uh, maybe changing our position if we come to know more details. Now, so we realize in this story that all the people around Jesus did not have the full picture. And I want to bring out the fact that delays are inevitable in this life. Whether it's the BTS or the bus or a traffic jam, waiting for someone, whatever it might be, delays are an inevitable part of our lives. And delays upset us, do they not? You get upset when, when there's some kind of delay, especially when it's unexpected. It's quite natural, right? Uh, that it does upset us. Um, but the problem is that it's our perspective. Because we live within time and space. And ever since the fall, and death was introduced, then we became finite. And we have this sense that we have a limited amount of time. So time becomes an imperative. You know one item I don't believe we'll have in heaven? There won't be any clocks on the wall in heaven. There won't be any calendars. Calendars and watches are byproducts of the fall. Because the moment Adam sinned, time began to make a difference. Right? Because there's death. If you live forever, okay, I'm not going to drop this, it's too precious. <laughs> What? Why does it matter? Why do we have to number our days if our days were infinite? So we live within time and space and we get upset when we face delays. But God is not limited to time and space. So God's time is not on our scale, not anywhere close. So what all the people here perceived as a delay was not a delay in God's perspective. And here's the encouraging thing. God never delays. 
It just appears to us to be a delay. But everything, think of the precision that is required for the universe to exist. 200 billion galaxies. More stars than all the grains of sand upon the earth. That my mind can't even begin to get around that. All of this revolving and moving. And we don't have chaos. We have beauty and wonder and precision. We set atomic clocks. <laughs> the fractions of a second. It is, and it's based on the atom and the way that it moves. So there is a remarkable precision. And everything happens according to God's time. Bring this home with you. And God's time is perfect. He's not ahead of schedule. He's not behind schedule. Every single thing that happens in God's purposes is in perfect time. The sooner we come to terms with that, the less impatient we are likely to be. So, God is never late and never early. And yet, why does it appear so often to us that He's taking His time? Let me point this out. God's love is not the love of an indulgent parent who gives in to every whim of a child. And God's purpose is to make us holy not to make us happy. When we partake and receive of His holiness, it will lead to a joy. But this joy that is of God is very different from what the world offers as the right to pursue happiness. Happiness is temporary. It is very subjective. It is very elusive. Joy is eternal. Joy has depth. It has will. It is height. So we are told that the delay of Jesus going to Mary and Martha is for the glory of God in order that the people might believe. So that is the refusal or the delay in going. The second R is in the reaction. What kind of reaction do we get particularly from Mary and Martha? So in verse 17 you can see Lazarus has been in the tomb four days. Now there's a reason for that. It's not like, just give it some time. Because in Jesus' time particularly, and in Jewish culture, they believed that the spirit, while it departed the body, it lingered. The spirit lingered for three days. Okay? The spirit lingered for three days and after that, the spirit would depart. And then real decay would set in. So there was a reason why Jesus delayed. And actually, we also see, if we try to put the time sequence together, that by the time the message was sent to Jesus, Lazarus was already dead. Okay? Because they said, hey, go send this to Jesus. Come quickly. Our brother is dying. But while the messenger was on the way, Lazarus had already passed away. And before the messenger actually got to Jesus, Lazarus was already gone. So basically, he, his delay had nothing to do with the death of Lazarus. So again, Mary and Martha didn't have the full picture. So when Jesus came, the first thing they said, Lord, if you had come earlier, 
That was a polite way of saying, what's wrong with you? You do miracles, you do all kinds of things. You walk on water, come on. Why did it take you so long to come? And if you had come, then our brother would not have died. I shudder when I turn on the light of self-examination and think, think of the times I have blamed God wrongly. How many times have we cried out to God in our frustration and ascribed to Him responsibility for things that have nothing to do uh, with God in a sense? So anyway, this is what greeted Jesus um, when He came finally to Mary and Martha. So we see there in verses 21 and 32 that both Mary and Martha uh, believe that if Jesus had come, their brother would not have died. But there's another assumption here that's a bit more subtle that I want to bring to your attention. Because I think we're closer to this position than understanding God's position. And that is, we think that God is here primarily to meet our needs. And I'm not even saying wants. I think if we journey long enough, we, we kind of can separate wants from needs, but we somehow feel that God is here to meet our needs. And I wish to point out that I want to encourage discernment because there is just so much theology out there that is premised on this. The fundamental assumption or presumption, which will be more accurate, that God is here to meet our needs. And I think that's the presupposition of what we loosely call the prosperity gospel. Right? So if you're sick, you pray, you get healed. If you've got a financial problem, you pray, money will come. If you've got a relation, relational problem, you pray and that will be solved. If you've got an enemy, pray and he'll disappear. So just pray. God will provide for these things. God is love. He wants to bless you. Very, very dangerous. And in the end, it impedes us. Because inevitably, in that perspective, God is going to appear to fail you. And then you're disappointed with God. And then you blame God. But the fundamental assumption was wrong in the first place. God doesn't exist to run around and meet your needs. I was sitting in a car last week in Singapore where there were a lot of cars and not enough parking spaces. And so we were driving to dinner and my host who was driving said, don't worry, let's pray. God will give us a parking lot. So I kind of tried to make a joke of it. I was trying to point out the error and the thinking and I said, oh, so you are the one who's taking up all the angel time looking for car park spaces. <laughs> huh? No wonder my prayers are not being answered because every time you need a car park, like 50 angels got to go check out the whole parking lot. <laughs> Why does God need to deploy angels to help you find the best bargain in, in the department store or, or the most convenient parking lot or clear the queue in front of you? When we were children, we spoke and we thought as a child. But when we turn to adults, such ways we need to put aside. God does not exist to meet our needs. He loves us, no doubt. And I think frequently He does accede to those things. But you know what? We exist to glorify God. We exist for His glory, not He for ours. 
And actually, it's not about who gets whose, what needs met. There is a wonderful design and purpose that can be fulfilled if we acknowledge God for who He is. And if we really worship Him for who He is, and as the song goes, and not for all the things that He has done, not for the mighty things that He has done, not for the little car park things for us that He has done, if we worship Him for who He is, we will be fulfilled. And I can tell you, when we stand in His presence and we behold His glory, we will have no more needs. The only reason we live in need is because we do not really know who God is. Would you agree with me on that? You think about that? I have often come with prayer requests and then be overwhelmed by the presence and the love and the magnificence of God. And it's wonderful at that point to say, I forgot what I came for. Really? It doesn't matter anymore. And I just need to bow and worship Him and acknowledge Him for who He is. You want in one moment to solve all your needs, to never have another need or want in your life? Get to terms with this strand of foundational theology. Cry out to God. This will be your last ever need. Cry out to God that He might give you an understanding of who He is. So Mary and Martha had no idea. And they thought that Jesus was there. And he failed to meet their need for the healing of their brother. Now, in verse 34, Jesus asked to be taken to the tomb of Lazarus. And then we have this, what is known as the shortest verse in the Bible, a little bit of biblical trivia. Jesus wept. Jesus wept. Quick question. Why did he weep? He was going to do something amazing. Probably in, on the human scale of miracles, that's like a 10, right? Huh? You know what I'm saying? Like headache, back pain, muscle ache, healing is like 0.5 on a scale of 1 to 10. Okay, so maybe cancer is like a 9, and then, oh, raising from the dead, 4 days, that's like a 10.5. <laughs> Not just 30 minutes or 45 seconds after the heart stopped. No, 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 this, no, that. this is the real stuff. 4 days wrapped up in a tomb. One day after the spirit is gone. Okay, this is a real McCoy stuff. It doesn't get any more genuine than this, okay? So he's going to perform this all-time 10.5 miracle. Why is he crying? If it was you or I standing there, it's like, man, they, they just don't know what's going to happen. And yet I have a kind of almost a... a cheeky smile on your face. Just wait till they see what I'm about to do. Man alive. This is going to be fun. This is going to be one of my most fun days ever. Well, he wept. And that speaks powerfully to me. Because God's not sitting on the throne saying, hey, they've got no idea. You know? He's not sitting there with kind of a know-it-all smile on his face and says, one day all this time, he'll be fine. No more tears, no more sorrow. Their mourning will be turned into dancing. He'll be okay. We sometimes forget that God has a father's heart. He 
parents, have we not looked upon our children when they had a fall or, or they were sick? And we know clearly this is not life threatening. It's part of learning. We know that it will pass. And yet, why do we feel pain? Have you and I not spent more nights than we care to remember looking over our sick child? God asked Jesus to reveal him as Abba. One of the most intimate terms in the Hebrew language for who a father is. Not this God who is behind the veil who can only be approached by many, many rituals and sacrifices, but as a father who would embrace his child. There's the story of the prodigal son, the father waiting. And when the son comes back, he runs out. And doesn't hold to the account that half the inheritance is gone. He gives him uh, the coat. He gives him back the ring. He kills the fatted calf. This is a large part of who God is. But I still have the word part. It is not all of who God is. But this is God, our Abba. He knows it will be made good. But he empathizes and sympathizes with our pain. God is never indifferent. If he knows the number of hair upon our head, he knows the number of tears that have come across your face. Think about that for a minute. Abba knows. A measure of the tears that you have wept from your very first cry. And he looks forward to the day when he will wipe that last tear from your eyes. Oh, glorious day. Isn't that a wonderful truth? So God is never, never indifferent. He says, even you who are evil know how to give good gifts to your children. How much more so your Father who is in heaven. When we feel pain, God feels it in far greater intensity because of His love for us. So Jesus wept there because of His frustration over how we have to deal with illness and death. He understands the challenges of living this earthly life because He was Emmanuel, God with us. He did not count the glory of heaven something to be grasped, but He emptied Himself and He became one of us. He understands. Now Jesus arrives at the tomb and then in verses 43 and 44 the miracle happens. So we have the refusal, the reaction, and then the revelation. Those are your three R's. Okay? But what does this miracle reveal to us? I think simply put firstly, it reveals to us that Christ not only has the power to rise himself, which he would do, but that he also has the power to raise the dead. And you see how both these aspects need to, needed to be revealed? If he was crucified and then he rose, we could still be saying, well, that was Jesus. That was God. Yeah, he can rise from the dead, but what about us? So here is a demonstration of the power of his word. Who was this speaking? I bring you to John chapter 1. 
And that's why this theology fits together. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. This is the Logos who spoke the worlds into order. This was the Logos who said, let there be light, and there was light. Nothing proceeds from the mouth of God that doesn't beget an action. When God speaks, it comes to pass. When God commands, it shall be obeyed. Who is this man? We are fishermen, we are professional sailors. Who is this man that the wind and the waves obey him? Do I need your palm fronds and your coats on the floor and the people to sing my praises? If I desired, I could bring forth praise from the stones. That's an interesting one for hi-fi and audiophiles. I could bring forth praise from the stones. There is nothing that God cannot speak and bring into order. That's who he is. So he speaks. He stands at the tomb. He could have commanded that stone to roll away on its own, as it did on the day of his resurrection, albeit with angels who weren't occupied with finding car park spaces. But the tomb was the stone was rolled back. He could have spoken that. Right? But here again is a simple lesson. He involves us. He involves us. Because we are his children. He lets us get involved. So he tells the people, roll back the stone. And then he speaks, Lazarus, come forth. I'd love to see the replay. I can't wait to see the replay of that day. Right? Hey, I think when we get to heaven, they, uh, uh, I stray here for a bit. When we get to heaven, there must be places we can go and watch all these replays, you know? Like, the parting of the Red Sea shows that, oh, we don't have watches anymore. Anytime, it just keeps running. You want to see the parting of the Red Sea? You want to see the chariots of fire? You, you want to see uh, Noah's Ark? You, you want to see the first day, second day, third day, fourth day of creation? Yeah, just, just go there. Um, and you can see all the replays of what took place. Oh, that's going to be magnificent. Cineplex to blow all cineplexes. Don't you think? Some of you are shaking your head like, I don't know this guy's theology. <laughs> it's okay. When I sit next to you in a cineplex, we'll go, ah, see, I told you. <laughs> But what happens? Lazarus come forth. And it's a bit silly, but it kind of like... Right? It, it, he could have been free. This is interesting, because when Jesus rose, all the grave clothes were there. And he was set free. But Lazarus comes out still bound in his grave clothes. And I think there's a reason for that. This is part of the revelation. The first part of that is, Jesus said, take off those grave clothes. So he needed help. Like I said, God involves us in his work. I believe that if it weren't for people like me trying to do ministry, Christ would have come sooner. <laughs> Honestly, I, I think we just get in his way. You know? And, and <laughs> really, when I reflect on my ministry, Oh, I'm so glad God is God. Because otherwise, I don't know how to account for this mess. But that's the beauty and the wonder of it. Out of His love, He allows us. And so, Jesus says, take off the grave clothes. But here I leave you with the last lesson. Lazarus had come back to life. And he responded to Jesus' call to come forth. But he is still impeded and still shuffling through because of the grave clothes 
and the bindings. And it just came to me in the preparation of this sermon that in the course of my ministry, I realize there's so many who still walk around with vestiges of those grave clothes. So many who understand and have received of the resurrection power of God. We have been crucified with Christ, yet we live. Yet not us, but Christ who lives in us. And we are reborn, we are born again, right? We rejoice in that. And yet, we need to be mindful of some of the grave clothes that still impede us. What is the form of those grave clothes? Old habits? Old thoughts? Even cultural thoughts? Attitudes? I leave that with you as sensitively as I know how, not in the spirit of judgment, because I stand under the same light of examination. I think all of us still have some bindings. And sometimes in our lives we still trip and we still suffer and we're impeded while God has given us the freedom and the right to walk free in the light of His glory. Walk in the light as He is in the light. And yet, we carry these grave clothes with us. But it's not for me or anyone to point out what those vestiges might be. I encourage you to think about it in your own time, in your reflection. And say, Lord, Continue to set me free. Let me realize in my life the truth of your word that if the sun sets you free, you shall be. Or maybe I should alter it a bit and suggest you should be free indeed. Amen. Let us pray. Lord, you have spoken in your life words of life. You declare afresh to each one of us today. Dana, Darren, David, Jim, Darcy, come forth. For you have made the way possible for a life to be lived that is free of the grave and all of the impediments of burial. Yes, at a point in our lives we have been crucified and buried and we have chosen to rise in new life and we thank you for that new life that we have that is in the name of Christ Jesus our Lord and Savior. But today, we realize through the story of Lazarus that the unfortunate reality is that we might still and often are impeded. Impeded by the things of this fallen world. Transform us by the renewing of our minds. Renew in us a right and clean heart, O oh God. For this is our prayer. Help us to receive more and more of the fullness of this life that you have come to give us. Help us to worship you for who you are. And in that one moment, take away all our needs. Show yourself to us, O oh God, that we might be set free to live in your joy and in your presence. We ask through Jesus' name. Amen.